Hello everyone and welcome to the IFST webinar Managing Waste at the Consumer Interface. This is the third in a series of webinars on food waste co-organised by IFST's Midlands branch, food regulatory and sustainability steering groups. I will now pass over to Andy Kerridge who will chair today's session. Thanks very much there Robin. I'm Andy Kerridge, I'm the chair of the IFST Midlands branch. When food is lost or wasted, it impacts the environment and the economy and waste resources at a time when many people can't access enough food to eat. To better understand food loss and food waste and identify opportunities to prevent it, IFST has created this webinar series on food waste. In this third webinar today, we will explore the food loss and food waste, which occurs at the consumer facing end of the value chain in both hospitality and retail. This is often called the last mile in food waste prevention. The further webinars in this series will follow the supply chain downstream to discuss packaging waste and to review how food waste can be used to help feed those in need through redistribution. And we will close this series with a live panel discussion reviewing the subject matter we have covered across these food waste webinars. It's also worth mentioning that our IFST Spring Conference SC21 at the end of April We'll also have a dedicated panel discussion on smart packaging, addressing food packaging development strategy, policy, trends and solutions. So keep an eye out on our IFST events page and email alerts for further details. To support understanding around this topic, IFST has already published an information statement of food waste for technical professional professionals to refer to and a fact sheet aimed more at the general public. You can find these on our IFST website. Next slide, please. So to our speakers today, we have Leah Riley-Brown and Eleanor Morris. Leah is sustainable, Sustainability Policy Advisor at the British Retail Consortium, and she's currently working on progressing the policy agenda for the UN Sustainable Development Goals by utilizing the BRC Climate Action Roadmap to get UK retailers to net zero by 2040. Eleanor is a guardian of Grub, what a title. And she's worked for RAP for the last 10 years and will discuss RAP's newest Guardians of Grub campaign to reduce annual food waste in the sector by 100,000 tonnes by 2025. For more information on their biographies, please look on the IFST website. And so without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Leah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and thank you to the IFSC team for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so as uh, Andy kindly introduced, I'm the Sustainability Policy Advisor at the BRC. Um, the BRC is the trade and membership organization for UK retailers. So I represent them uh, when dealing with anything to do with policies as they relate to sustainability. And I'm here today to talk to you about how retailers are helping to reduce the food waste in their supply chains. So to start off with some good news, um, which I think we all need, uh, is that conscious consumerism is continuing to rise, um, even during this pandemic, uh, as you know, different types of consumers are linking food waste directly to the climate crisis. I think the, the bad news is that there's still a majority of consumers, and again, particularly with um, those who are gone on furlough or lost wages, um, still a majority of consumers who are swayed by, by low pricing. So it's a, a, a battle between the two. But the good news on top of all of that is that this new normal becomes an opportunity for, for brands and retailers to really push for products that have lower environmental impacts, um, as the default um, and to start to map their supply chains and retrofit for sustainability measures um, and then to hopefully put policies in place. And this was showcased um, as the UK launched more vegan and, and vegetarian products in 2018-2019, in um, both in supermarkets and in food to go. Uh, I think it grew by an extraordinary amount, by 987%, um, which is amazing to see. Um, and in terms of food waste, BRC is very supportive of RAP um, and the food waste roadmap, which you'll hear a little bit later uh, about. 
um, and we're continually pushing for a greater alignment across the whole of the value chain to tackle food waste. And again, you know, to date, several retailers have reported over the last year diverting 12,500 tons of food waste from landfill, which is worth nearly 40 million pounds. Environmental sustainability continues to be sort of at the top of the list um, of priorities for consumers. And this is on the back of you know, the David Attenborough and, and Greta effects. Um, more and more consumers are caring about food waste because they have a better understanding of how and why climate change happens. And the way that brands and retailers are really stepping up is uh, by using the sustainable development goals, as you see here, which is um, a UN framework for pushing progress across the industry uh, and in line with discussions with, with governments across the world. The SDGs um, are creating a pathway to 2030 for businesses and governments to tackle some of the planet's biggest issues. And the UK's um, COP26 conference happening in Glasgow in November this year will be a great platform for all stakeholders to come together and really talk through the challenges of the next decade of action. BRC launched our own campaign using the SDGs called Better Retail, Better World um, in 2018. Um, and as you can see here, we started out with five of the 17 goals. And we're really looking to integrate more and more of the SDGs um, in our campaign to ensure that we are being the most progressive and ambitious industry we can be, working with our members who are retailers and pushing for more governmental action. We know that the UK has a target to get to net zero by 2050, but we wanted to be even more ambitious. Um, so in November, 2020, we launched our climate action roadmap to get the whole of the retail industry to net zero, um, 10 years ahead of schedule, hopefully. And this includes um, interim targets like all electricity use to be net zero by 2030, all fuel, gas, and refrigerants to be net zero by 2035, and then all products to be net zero by 2040. And tackling food waste is an integral part of this plan. And it's up to retailers, manufacturers, government bodies and consumers all to play their part. So what's currently being done by retailers? Well, uh, retailers will ensure a variety of processes kick into uh, gear before food actually becomes waste. Because uh, that's the best way to um, ensure that everything is being, uh, that can be eaten can. Um, and one of which is the, the management of surplus from suppliers, but also um, rotating stock uh, in store to sell the food through a markdown system. However, you know, you're only as good as your data. So retailers are continually utilizing um, their own to improve their stock forecasting so that waste doesn't occur in the first place. Once the products become wastage, as in they didn't sell, um, they're split into categories with, within the store, including marking if the packaging has been damaged or if it's past its best before, before date, um, if it's past its use by date, so it's not edible, it's not safe to be moved on, um, so that store employees can dictate which exit it needs to go to. Um, and retailers will have several of these in, in place and several of these routes to help divert food from landfill, including sending it to their own um, staff canteens, um, sending it to redistribution charities um, or to anaerobic digestion. And most of the food redistribution to charities is done through a, a, a local network. Um, so built up relationships within the community with collectors uh, and charities. And this really makes a really big difference um, in those local communities. But I think one of the big challenges um, that retailers currently face is building those relationships um, because it is, it is hard to find the logistics to be everything to be delivered and collected um, and charities for, for every single store. So as I mentioned before, COVID has certainly highlighted that people are buying more conscientiously um, and buying enough food so they don't waste it. Um, but of course, there's, there's more that can always be done. Um, retailers and suppliers can embed a zero food waste to landfill policy in store um, and, and at their own um, headquarters. 
so that the whole of the organization keeps itself accountable. Companies are also announcing more and more net zero commitments um, as reflected in, in uh, what I was speaking about earlier, the BRC climate roadmap. Um, and, and this is great. I mean, it, you know, we all need to be as ambitious as we can because this is an issue that still needs to be tackled. So for food and drink businesses, this includes, this should include an alignment to uh, SDG 12.3 which is a 50% reduction in food waste, and to link it to measurable targets in their own operations with suppliers and more. Um, food waste messaging and campaigning should also continue, but um, perhaps you know, utilized in other avenues. One retailer uh, who has a healthy eating campaign um, where food waste isn't you know, the main driver uh, it's not the main message, but it's embedded within it. Some are also some retailers are also using gamification through in-store promotions and apps to increase fruit and veg consumption, but to ensure that it's not wasted. And lastly, BRC and our members were continually pushing for a level playing field, um, and we we are eagerly awaiting the the UK government's introduction of a, a mandatory food waste reporting legislation, uh, because again, you know. We work with a, a lot of great retailers who, who have this passion and, and knowledge to tackle food waste. Um, but you know the level playing field and the regulatory alignment is, is crucial. So what I'm seeing happen is that retailers are really coming together to manage these short-term impacts, um, vocalizing that we need to have the outlook for what's to come over the next few, few years as well. BRC has been working with, with our members, with retailers and with governments, government bodies to have a pragmatic, but again, an ambitious approach to tackling food waste and the climate crisis. And if sustainability wasn't on the horizon for you as a business before, it certainly should be now. I think um, it's really hard to ignore um, all the effects of, of climate change. And again, food waste is a great way to tackle it. Um, even if your business can't retrofit sustainability policies, it's, it's a great way to, um, to sort of start on your journey, to map your supply chain and all of its tiers, because it's much easier to ignore the problem if you can't see it. And not only are consumers asking more questions, but investors are as well. So public companies with strong environmental and social government governance credentials will come out on top as investors are really looking at actions through not only a financial lens, but a sustainable and purpose-driven lens as well. And again, COVID-19, I think, might be a catalyst for the industry to really improve its reputation for making a positive impact with regards to these issues and, and many others. But really, we, we can't afford to, to lose the momentum we've built you know, as, as an industry and across all the different sectors. Um, in terms of raising awareness and, and really taking action to tackle the climate crisis. So again, even though um, COP26 was meant to happen last year, it was postponed, um, it's still happening hopefully this year. Um, there's still a huge movement of action from consumers and businesses to keep on top of it and to all play our part. And it's almost as if COVID-19 has been a good practice run to make supply chains even more resilient um, and has highlighted how closely we're all uh, connected globally um, and locally on a business and, a, and on a societal level. And that's all from me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, really great to hear um, about everything that BRC are doing on this agenda, which fits really nicely with uh, the area that I'll be talking about today. So. Um, thanks so much to um, the AVST team for inviting RAP to, to talk at this webinar. You may have heard from my colleague Darren, who spoke um, at an earlier webinar in the series, and also some of our um, the, the teams that we work with in the businesses speaking earlier about their activities that they've been doing on food waste. So my name's Eleanor. I work for RAP. We're a not-for-profit organisation based in the UK, but we do operate globally. 
Um, our vision is to have a world where resources are used sustainably. So we work with governments, businesses, communities to deliver practical solutions through voluntary agreements. Um, and that includes food waste, plastics and uh, sustainable clothing. So we bring stakeholders uh, together to collaborate and innovate in order to tackle those collective challenges. As, as Leah mentioned, that collective activity is really important to making change happen on the ground. So I'm hoping my slides going to move on. Uh, Andy gave us this context, and I'm sure most of you on the call are familiar, uh, but just to reiterate, you know, the reason why food waste is really important to tackle is because we are wasting a third of it. Meanwhile, people are going hungry, it's contributing to climate change and it's affecting profits. So that's really where all of the work that RAP is doing on hospitality and food service is tackling those three areas. It's about um, feeding people, not bins. It's about making the link between uh, food waste and the planet and the impact of climate change. And it's also, uh, which is particularly important at the moment with the situation that we're in, it's about managing profits more effectively and making sure that none of that profit ends up in the bin. So in the UK, again, Leah's covered this beautifully, where we're tackling food waste by taking the global UN Sustainable Development Goal 12.3, which is around halving uh, global per capita food waste by 2030. Um, we're interpreting this in the UK through the UK Food Waste Reduction Roadmap, and Darren uh, described this in great detail in an earlier webinar. So if you're not familiar with that and you're interested, please do uh, go into that, that. I think it was the first IFST uh, webinar. Within the UK, the voluntary agreement approach that we take to tackling food waste and carbon and water is through our voluntary agreement, Courtauld Commitment 2025. And that's really the framework where Guardians of Grub sits within. It's about reaching the hospitality and food service sector um, through a collective action. So we do that within the Courtauld framework. So it helps us deliver our targets against um, the roadmap, but also Courtauld 2025. Now, the roadmap itself covers all UK food and drink businesses. Um, what we recognised when uh, we were looking at the UK Food Waste Reduction Roadmap and that, that Target Measure Act approach was that there was there were some specific challenges for um, our UK hospitality and food service sector. <clears throat> Excuse me. So within the UK, we have um, a more detailed action plan that has the milestones you can see at the bottom for the years that those are targets for and our actions around that. So we'll be recruiting larger organisations. We'll be working with waste management companies to improve data because we know that's really critical uh, from, from the waste collection side. We'll also be working on government procurement so that you're getting that message built into procurement messages, um, as well as uh, working uh, with our partner organisations to cascade Guardians of Grub. So you can see those stages and the progress that we'll be delivering. In the UK, we know that the sector um, throws away over a million tonnes of food every single year. And the most staggering fact of that is that 75% of that food could have been eaten. So it's that's the area that we really want to tackle and focus on is really food that could have been eaten should not be ending up in the bin. So how do we go about that? This is an illustration um, and it is indicative. Please don't take these uh, numbers as, um, as having been recently uh, defined, but this is based, it's an illustrative example based on rap research. Um, if you take a hundred potatoes that are grown in the field, you have an amount of loss along that, uh, that production line. So you'll lose some from disease, some from grading and so on. So by the time you get to the hotel in this example, you've lost 31 of those potatoes from different aspects. Once the potatoes end up in the hotel, you lose nine of them from spoilage. So they've gone off or, or not been stored properly. 20 to prep. So if you're peeling those potatoes, you get about the equivalent 20 that are thrown away. And 15 of the potatoes end up coming back on the plate. So from the consumers in the hotel 
they waste 15 of those potatoes. So of the 100 potatoes that are grown in the field, you get 25 that are eaten. And the reason why potatoes are particularly important in the UK is they are the most wasted food, both within a hospitality setting, but also in the home as well. So um, people often see potatoes as quite a low value food, but actually when you look at the amount of wastage, uh, it's really important. The thing that I really want to point out is, firstly, this is a collective issue, as Leah raised, um, and we, that's how we see it. We see it as a collective issue, but for the hospitality and food service sector in particular, and how you communicate and interact with your consumers, you need to understand what these numbers are. You need that data. You need to understand what how, how much food is coming from spoilage, from prep, from plate, so that then you can understand where your hotspots are and then you can work together with your teams to tackle those. So for example, if your prep is, is this high on potatoes, you might want to keep the skin on those potatoes. Not only is it healthier, it saves time. And actually, when you look at the supply chain, it means that your grading options are broadened. So you don't need to have such tight specifications for the type of potatoes if you're peeling them. So what the Guardians of Grub uh, tools and materials do are enable you, so we've got tracking sheets and so on, practical tools, so that you can work out with your teams where food waste is happening, whether it's at prep stage, spoilage, um, plate or other. So if you're in a hospital, for example, you might have overproduction. If you're in a hotel, you might have a buffet, for example. Um, we've launched uh, a new website for the 2021 campaign. It's um, really easy to navigate. We've got a great new savings calculator. I've got a screenshot on the next slide. Um, but really, um, we've got these fantastic toolkits for Food Waste Action Week, which I'll just talk about briefly, um, with very detailed partner plans if you're an operator in hospitality or if you're an organisation with an interest in hospitality. Um, we've got exactly what you can do with links through to everything that you need to get involved with Food Waste Action Week and, and take those practical steps. Um, you can pledge to become a guardian and we've also got some free courses and loads of case studies available on the website. This is our quick saving calculator. So if you don't think that food waste is a problem, um, you can put in how many covers a week you serve, what sort of business you are, and it will tell you how much food waste is costing you. And then if you set a target, so you have an option of what target you would like to set, it will tell you how much that would save you a year and the equivalent in carbon and uh, cars off the road. We've got a fantastic 15 minute quick and easy um, Cost, sales, cost saving skills course to help you understand exactly how to implement Target Measure Act in a hospitality setting. It signposts you off to tools um, and guidance and really helps you get ready to, to take action right now. And we're also doing a Becoming a Champion pilot. So there are some quite uh, short deadlines on this. Again, it's UK only, I'm afraid, but if you're not operational, you can still do this course. So we have five levels on the course, ranging from um, operational getting measure measurement and you get certificates and knowledge checks throughout that, right through to senior management where you're building in food waste KPIs, uh, you're describing food waste attributes within job descriptions and so on. So please do get in touch if you're interested in that. Uh, I really wanted to flag to you in the UK, we have the very first Food Waste Action Week coming up in March. We're really excited about this. We've got some fantastic assets um, that are all embargoed until the beginning of March. But if you are interested, please do email lfhw at rap.org.uk. That stands for Love Food, Hate Waste, which is our consumer facing campaign. Um, what this Food Waste Action Week does is, as well as reaching out to UK citizens, um, we will also be providing the hospitality sector with a fantastic opportunity to talk to clients, to talk to staff, to either get started on tackling food waste or celebrate what activities and savings have been made and really celebrating those food heroes within the sector. And the link between food waste and climate change is is something that is at the core of this Food Waste Action Week. So Leah mentioned how important food waste was with and connecting that with climate change. We know that around 80% of people in the UK are concerned about climate change, but actually 37 think that food waste is connected to it. So it's that that we're trying to build on. We're trying to make that emotional connection. We've got um, 
lots of uh, press and materials going out. We've got government ministers bought, bought into this and leading the, the direction of this. We've got fantastic engagement across all sectors, um, charities, local authorities, universities, trade bodies. We're really excited about this Food Waste Action Week. So uh, it would be great to have you involved. Um, what this will do to you, for you is that it will show your customers uh, that you're taking a stand, that this matters to you. It positions you as food heroes. You're talking the talk. Um, sorry, walking the walk rather than talking the talk. Um, and it also highlights your company values. It attracts talent. It, we know it's, it helps with staff retention. And it's a really positive message, um, which we know, you know, is really challenging at this it's this current time so it's great to have an opportunity to talk positively about the work that everyone's doing um, on this area so please do join us uh, only by working together are we going to make a difference and as a collective so we really want to empower everyone to make a difference so going back to the hospitality sector um, please encourage uh, your teams or your organizations to sign up show us your your heroic skills get creative share learning top tips what do you what have you found what are you proposing that you're going to do and please do engage on social media with us we'd love to hear uh, from you about all the work that you're doing and uh, really get that conversation going over to andy Okay, thanks very much there, uh, both of you, Lee and Eleanor. Uh, interesting presentations. We've got a number of questions that have come through already, so we'll move on to the Q&A section. First question is, there are, are, of course, many meat businesses who have achieved net zero already. These range from PLCs to SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. Other vertically integrated businesses have invested in green energy production along their supply chain. The businesses who already have retail contracts have of course retained their markets. However, those who have achieved net zero, but don't have retailer contracts, tell us that they are struggling to get their products considered for stocking either at local, regional or national level. Do you have any suggestion how their net zero low emission foods can get onto the shelves of UK's retailers. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tricky one. And um, I think the supplier to retailer relationship is, is gonna differ pretty much across the board. But um, so I, I can't really speak much to getting um, products onto shelves because I think that you know those are relationships that are built um, directly um, with the retailers. However, what I will say is um, from sort of anecdotally what I've what I've seen working with supermarkets uh, is that they are looking for these credentials and, and backed by by data, backed by science. So any products that do have a lower environmental impact um, and do you know have the claims and and again, backed up by, by data to that they will contribute less emissions, um, the better. Uh, certainly, um, again, I sort of uh, touched upon it at the, at the very big beginning of my presentation. So um, we all know, you know, meat and, and dairy have higher emissions. So there, there is a push for um, more vegetarian um, plant-based products um, and meals. Um, so I know that doesn't quite answer your question about, you know, meat based products, but certainly I think, you know, for ones that, um, that are, you know, that do have and contain meat and, and dairy, again, it's, it's utilizing the data and ensuring that that is sort of front and center in those discussions, because I think that certainly is what retailers are looking for. Yeah, and if I can just um, add quickly, um, there's a guide called Meet in a Net Zero World that RAP have produced together with stakeholders. So if you're not familiar with that, then um, yeah, please, please do have a look. It's on our uh, website. So that's Meet in a Net Zero World. Um, next question is um, more for the hospitality side is from my experience as a kitchen manager, the majority of consumer food waste comes from self service all you can eat carts, including salad items and breakfast items. Have RAP done any work with the hospitality sector in trying to mitigate this type of food waste? 
It's a really good question. I think, yeah, uh, in answer to, to your question, we have got some guidance about how to address some of these, but I would go back to the point that, um, you know, if, if you don't know where the waste is coming from, it is invis invisible. Going back to Leah's point, um, you know, if you don't have the data, you don't know what the problem is. So unless you're starting to measure and track that, then you've got some evidence that you can then say, look, we've got, you know, there's a lot of food that, that is ending up in the bin here. What can we do as a business to tackle that? And all the tools that we've got in Guardians of Grub is really about engaging your teams who have got all of the answers to these. We have guidance, you know, you can, you can um, change the business model uh, for how you serve things. And we've got lots of case studies and examples. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot that can be done, but ultimately if you have the data and you have the teams engaged, then actually you can see how that will affect and reduce the amount of, of food that's ending up in the bin. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody's asking for the real number uh, numbers for food waste for potatoes, but I guess yeah, yeah you can't. It's so that is an illustrative model. We, yeah. you know, we haven't ever done an entire chain on a particular type like that. So it is taking pockets of data just to illustrate that actually this is a whole chain issue. And we all need to work together and communicate. You know, sometimes if you change one element, it simply moves that waste somewhere else in the supply chain. So this is about understanding how everything works, connect, you know, is connected. And again, you've got that data, and that's what the roadmap can provide is everybody is consistently providing the same food waste data. So then you've got something that's comparable to each other, and you can start having those conversations. Because if you don't have the facts, if you don't know where the waste is coming from, you can't start to have that dialogue and work out what the solutions are. Yeah. Um, there's a question here about labeling uh, and whether more can be done in terms of labeling to inform consumers about the food waste that is likely taking place to get that product to the shelves. Is, is, there, is there moves on, on that sort of area? demonstrating the green credentials if you like yeah so i can i can certainly start but i, I know rap is doing quite a lot of work on uh on food packaging to, to try and help mm -hmm. bolster the you know consumer behavior piece for tackling food waste so yeah i think um labeling is um one element uh it's not sort of a silver bullet solution to to tackling food waste um, you know, classic example in the non-food world is um, labels on clothing and, you know, how best to wash. They've done a lot of research that shows uh, people don't actually abide by it. They just sort of do what they have always done. So it's really, really hard to change um, a consumer's behavior um, just by the label. So I think uh, consumer education campaigns um, certainly wrap, again, leading leading the way on this that, that BRC is very supportive of, um, as well as supermarkets and other food to go chains, um, utilizing that messaging in house, you know, so directly to their own, their own consumers as well, I think is the best way to do it. I, you know, I touched upon a healthy eating campaign, you know, trying to increase fruit and veg. Um, so it's not talking about food waste. Um, and it's not using the sort of, you know, negative messaging to say you know food waste is bad it's saying you know you can be good and and eat healthily and here's how to ensure that you're not wasting your your apples and your bananas so i think it's 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 uh, labeling is certainly one part of it um but uh it's it's certainly not the, the whole picture Yeah, so if I just uh, pick up on a, on a few things, so, so labelling's quite a huge issue, actually. So you've got, obviously, you've got a limited space on your label to communicate information. Some of that information is, is mandatory. Uh, so obviously, you have to convey that. Um, so actually, using the labels to convey messages can be quite challenging. So the, the work that we've got um, around labelling is really about storage as well, so that you can really keep that food for as long as possible, whereas you might be worried it's, it's going off and so on. So we've got lots of guidance around 
uh, labeling of food for um, safety. So it's all you know signed off by the Food Standards Agency and DEFRA and so on. So that's one aspect. And that also helps with um, surplus food and redistribution as well, uh, adhering to, to that guidance. Then we've got you know all the information that you might want about uh, recycling that packaging and, and you'll be talking about that later in your series so there's that aspect as well um, so using the packaging to convey aspects of food waste can be really challenging what we're hoping and planning that food waste action week will do and the research that we we have is that making that emotional connection between climate change and food waste will stimulate people moving into more of an action-based approach so in the household using love food hate waste uh, tools and materials we've got loads of campaigns there we also have a behavior change intervention stream of work uh, with consumers, um, as, as Leah mentioned, and we, we get those insights and interventions. So we test different ways of that are gonna um, make a difference to people. So we've got some fantastic um, work that's being piloted that if that works and it's proven, then we'll start rolling that out. So there's sort of a research piece there before it gets to a rollout stage because obviously we need it to work it's a huge investment to um to change any any kind of labeling i've got a couple of questions about um a food waste tool for households is there a, a plan uh, to make that available so there's absolutely loads of uh, materials and support and uh information on the love food hate waste website and that is all geared to um to householders we also have a partners website where um any organization that reaches out to householders so local authorities retailers manufacturers and so on can take those assets and put them on their materials and cascade and share that information in terms of a, a food waste measurement tool within a household setting um, i'm aware that there there are pockets of work going on around this um, but actually having something that is used commonly in households to track food waste isn't something we've considered obviously in the uk there's a rollout of uh food waste collections which the waste management companies will have data on the local authorities will have data on so you will start to see consistent numbers coming out from the householders in terms of the collection so that will give us better numbers at a macro level rather than the detail at each householder level but within food waste action week you know part of the pledge part of the challenge could be to to keep a food waste diary and try your best to, to have zero food waste and try out some new ways um top tips you know completing is one of the campaigns we have where you you eat the whole uh, item of food and be, you're creative with how you you eat that um better storage freezing planning uh planning your your uh shopping and, and your meals is is a really effective way to reducing uh, food waste as well okay thank you uh what would you advise a product de developer to think about and incorporate into their ways of working when developing a product to ensure or, or minimize or, uh, waste by consumers. You get that? Breaking up a little bit, no. but um, I think you're talking it's about, about product what, development. Yeah. Yeah. So um, again, uh, a little bit outside of of my remit, mm -hmm. but certainly uh, I think it to tackle food waste means we have to look at it holistically. We have to know where it's coming from, how it's grown, um, ensuring that suppliers are um, relaying that information to, to retailers. Retailers are then able to sort of use that data um, to then push it down the, their value chain to get to consumers. So in terms of a product developer, ensuring that you're using the whole part of the, you know, the carrot, the whole part of the potato, um, that everything gets used to really reduce the amount of food that is wasted, um, I think is, is really crucial. And again, it, I think it, it means that everybody within that process, um, if they're aware of the issue, they can actually tackle the issue. Um, and Eleanor made that point really well, is that, you know, we all have a part to play in this. Um, and, and no one is sort of uh, outside of that of that scope, but yeah, I'm um, 
I'm not a product developer myself, so I, I can't say for sure, but, but that would be my, my sort of first take on um, how they can get involved. I think in a, in a half setting, so if, if the product is then your menu, for example, actually what we know and what we've got um, materials on is that streamlining your ingredients and your menu planning and understanding what are the what are the high waste menu planning items. We've got a really great um, series of case studies from some pubs in England called uh, Robinson's Brewery ha have a number of pubs and they did some fantastic work with the Guardians of Grub tools. And um, what they do is they, every time they introduce a new menu, they then uh, monitor and track the, the food waste from that test menu before they roll it out. So they understand exactly what the more popular items, what the less popular items, so that when they're creating their menu, they've got minimizing food waste in mind. And that might be that you have uh, optional extras. It might be that you uh, have a particular portion size um, or that you offer, you know, with bread as, a, as an additional option, because often bread and sides are things that, that, are, that are left out. And in terms, I guess, of uh, the design of a product, if it's, it's to, it, to, to be delivered, then obviously designing for recyclability is critical um, in terms of uh, considering sustainability more broadly and also multi-packs. So um, in catering scenarios, you know, talking to your suppliers and understanding, right, I've got a multi-pack, but I've only, it seemed like a bargain because I, you know, the cost per item was reduced, but actually I end up throwing half of those packs unused away. It's not value for money at all. So it's about working together with your suppliers about multi-packs and, uh, and seeing this, if there's other, other more effective ways of, of getting the same product there. Excellent, thanks. Um, I uh, about COVID disru disruption here. The organization I work for uh, has signed up to meet in a net zero world. Great initiative, but it has been, uh, I'd say, slightly disrupted. I'd say anything, uh, we've all been disrupted by COVID. What oh, sorry, I think we've just lost Andy. Um, the end of the question was, what plans does RAP have to take meat in a net zero world forward? Thanks, Robin. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, in terms of the next steps for meat in a net zero world, I would need to come back to you on that. I don't have the uh, the detailed steps for the next plan. So um, by all means, do, um, do get in touch with me and I can uh, I can get that information for you. Um, is the Guardians of Group suitable for the manufacturing sector? We actually have um, a pack and it's all in the um, UK Food Waste Reduction Roadmap. So you'll find all the links to the materials. So we have uh, something called Your Business's Food, Don't Throw It Away, which is a pack of materials specifically designed for manufacturing. So um, it's much more relevant uh, to you as a manufacturing site. So again, freely available. Please um, do have a look at the uh, roadmap and you'll get the links for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, apologies, we've uh, lost Andy again. Uh, the next question is, is the food waste certification exercise only for registered businesses? So the food waste certification, I'm hoping I'm interpreting this correctly. So we have um, the Becoming a Champion learning um, which has certificates and that's all about um, developing knowledge in the hospitality sector for um, applying uh, food waste reduction approaches. So that's just for that pilot learning programme that we have live. Um, I'm not sure I've answered the question. Do come back okay. if okay. I worked for a lot of samples during first productions and product development. Okay. I think we're really struggling with this one, Robin. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'll step in. Um, I work for a food importer. Uh, we receive a lot of samples during first productions and new product developments. Currently, we have a charity that we can donate to. However, the regulations and controls to do so are so stringent that we find ourselves either disposing of or consuming amongst ourselves. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's uh, it's a a big problem because obviously, you know, with food waste, um, 
it still has to be edible, has to be healthy and safe um, to be passed down to even to a charity. Um, so there are strict regulations in place uh, for, for the health and safety of, of people, you know, so it's, it's, it's really important that that stays front and center. Now, I think there will obviously be uh, food, lace, food, food waste losages through, throughout, you know, due to, as I mentioned, packaging um, maybe gets dented. And so it's completely fine, but, but maybe a retailer doesn't want to put it on, on the shelf. So, you know, there's no um, health or safety risks at all. But I think uh, even if you're passing it to, to a charity, to a, a food redistribution um, center, um, you have to be very, very careful because I, I, you know it, it can't make anybody sick or ill um, or even worse. So I think um, it doesn't answer your question in full because you know those regulations will still be in place. However, um, I think if you can have the sort of fourth or thought or insights into what tends to get wasted the most, um, what tends to spoil or, or go off um, more quickly. So you can sort of uh, have sort of prioritization lists as it were. Um, so you can make sure that that stuff that's gonna go off really, really quickly gets out the door to the, to the food re redistribution or charity. Um, and then anything that's more shelf stable um, then you have a little bit more time to play with. So, uh, yeah, so I think, you know, we, we have to, we have to keep those regulations sort of in mind for sure. Um, but it's just about, yeah, trying to, trying to prioritize and, and move a little bit, um, with, with whatever type of food you're, you're dealing with. Yeah. And, and just to build on that from, from Leah. So we also, RAP has got the food surplus network um in the uk so you can if you're a charity you can describe you can add yourself and describe what you receive um and also if you have surplus you can look at local areas that have providers and it will describe exactly uh what's available as well um we work really closely with the fsa and defra on um on surplus redistribution we've been managing some emergency grants as a result of of covid as well so there's absolutely loads of information on the RAP website. And just to say, you know, we do work closely with uh, Chartered Institute of Environmental Health and working with environmental health practitioners and trading standards officers to understand what are some of their concerns if, if the advice is, is coming through. We're, we're keen to improve that consistency as well. So if you do have any examples or any uh, specifics, then please do email us at surplus at rap.org.uk and, and we can see, um, you know, we can feed that back and, and factor it in. Brilliant, thank you. So the next question is regarding food waste valorization, what is your advice to enhance the process to bring upcycled food products into the market and onto the plate? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what an upcycled food product would be. So it's really difficult for me to answer that question. Um, upcycling to me means you're taking one thing and converting it into something completely different. Um, so if I take a sort of loose interpretation of that, then potentially um, you're peeling potatoes and you have potato skins. What do you use with the potato skins? Uh, can you make that into a new product? Um, for, for retailers, um, I think that would be very, very difficult because what you have to remember is obviously, you know, for, you know, in the UK, the top 10 retailers are quite large um, and they need to be able to have product at scale and at volume to push out. So anything that's um, wastage in the development of a, of a new product uh, or a meal um, probably doesn't have the, the volume to then be put into a new product. However, as I sort of discussed in my presentation, that doesn't mean that it just goes to waste. Um, so, you know, a lot of, uh, most of the sort of bigger supermarket chains, um, they'll have staff canteen areas. So, you know, they can utilize um, some of the products that, that might be off cuts or, or peels or something like that. Um, and then I think the, the other, 
um, exit route that I that I touched upon is anaerobic digestion as well. Uh, and of course, you know, the the food waste hierarchy is, you know, anything that um, is edible can, you know, still safe for consumption should be um, still eaten. Uh, but um, anaerobic digestion is a good way to ensure that it just doesn't go to landfill, that it can be converted into energy. So hopefully that answers your question if I interpreted it correctly. I think so, yeah. Yeah, and anything? we've also, Hello? oh sorry, yes, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah, so um, Rack did some work on valorization. So if you uh, Google food waste valorization wrap, then you will find some a range of resources ranging from business uh, case presentation, mapping tools, case studies, uh, and so on about how how organisations have tackled that. So hopefully that will um, answer any questions and enable you to uh, have some resources um, at your fingertips to, to take that forward. Thank you very much. So we're on to our final question. Have the panel seen AHDB's We Eat Balanced campaign? Their recipe websites, Simply Beef and Lamb, Love Pork and Love Potatoes all have great recipe ideas for using leftovers. Uh, so again, um, you know, BRC, we are uh, very supportive of, you know, RAP, um, um, AHDB, uh, any and other um, organizations that have these campaigns, because again, we all have a part to play to tackle food waste and, and the climate crisis. So um, where we can sort of band together and have that sort of joint, you know, collective action um, is all the better. Um, and certainly, um, we're all consumers at the end of the day. You know, we all eat food. Um, and so I think having all of these different channels to talk about, you know, different recipes to use leftovers, how to freeze properly, um, what foods are most wasted in, in the country that you live in, all of that helps to really raise awareness um, and galvanize efforts. So yeah, really supportive of all of those campaigns. Okay. And Eleanor, anything from you on that? Yeah, just echoing uh, oh, okay. what Leah said. Yeah, and, and we'd love to see all of that being tagged into the Food Waste Action Week and, you know, really sharing those fantastic resources that exist. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity to, to raise awareness and, uh, and, and help people take action wherever they are. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Leah, Eleanor and Andy. And thank you to everyone from across the globe for attending the webinar today. If we didn't manage to answer your questions, please contact the speakers directly. Their details are on the screen now. If you'd like to catch up on any past IFST webinars, please visit www.ifst.org forward slash webinars. Finally, we would like to remind you of those not familiar with IFST, you can find useful resources on our website, including our COVID-19 Knowledge Hub and online food science and technology magazine. We welcome new members, so please check out our membership benefits page on the IFST website. As mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, please keep an eye out on our IFST events page and email alerts for future webinars in our series on food waste. Thank you so much again, Leah, Eleanor and Andy, and everyone for attending today. Goodbye.